Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to St. Luke's this morning. Today is the fourth Sunday in the season of Advent. And we've all heard it said that it's better to give than to receive. But not today. Today, as we consider the example of Mary, we see that when it comes to what God gives us in Christ, it's better to receive. To receive the salvation, the forgiveness, the blessedness that our Lord gives us. We'll begin this morning with our opening gathering rite. The, congregations, the congregation is invited to join in the refrain each time it's sung. our God who was, who is, and who is to come, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We are not holy as God demands. We have sinned against him in our words and actions, as well as with our self-righteous thoughts and attitudes. Silently reflect on the sins that have been hidden in your heart. Prophet Isaiah declared that the virgin would give birth to a son and he would be called Emmanuel. Jesus is that son and on the cross he shed his holy precious blood. The blood of Jesus purifies us from every sin. According to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Take away the burden of our sins and make us ready for the celebration of your birth, that we may receive you in joy and serve you always. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our epistle lesson today is from Paul's Letter to the Romans, the final chapter where he praises the eternal God and Father of Jesus Christ. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, 
according to the revelation of the mystery that was veiled in silence for long ages past, but now has been revealed through the prophetic scriptures and made known to all the Gentiles in keeping with the command of the eternal God, resulting in the obedience of faith. To God who alone is wise, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand for the gospel. As it was mentioned in the introduction to our service, the gospel is Mary receiving the word of the angel Gabriel in faith and also receiving the Lord Jesus. We read from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from, a to- from God to a town of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin pledged in marriage to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But she was greatly troubled by the statement and was wondering what kind of greeting this could be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, because you have found favor with God. Listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Listen, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, even though she was called barren. And this is her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, See, I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is the gospel of our Lord. This time we'll have our children's devotion message, especially for uh, little people. One of the words in our text today is forever. Forever. What does that mean? Long, long, long time, forever. We have a lot of stuffed animals at my house. This is just one little stuffed animal. Um, little teddy bear, and we named him Hemingway. And Hemingway is about 30 years old. This is my little stuffed puppy, um, Scruffy. And Scruffy is 68 years, 7 months, and 28 days old. Uh, my dad got me Scruffy the day, the day that I was born. And he used to be compacted. I hugged him so much that he was like a little Sharpie, and then my mom went and restuffed them, which was bad. <laughs> bad. Don't repeat that. Forever, forever. This is a dinosaur, a Diplodocus, and they are ballpark 6,000 years old. That's not forever. That's just 6,000. A lot of dinosaurs. This is a, don't say it all at once, Stegosaurus, and the bad end of a Stegosaurus is this part, and if you get on their bad side, again, 6,000 years old, not forever. My grandchildren see the cranes in the pond, and they think they are pterodactyls. Pterodactyls also ballpark about 6,000 years old. This is not even close to forever. How old is God? He's forever. He has no beginning. He has no middle. He has no end. He always was. He always will be. He changes not. That's why he likes to call himself the great I am. He didn't used to be, is, will be. He doesn't have bad days, crabby days, awful days, then real nice, oh, I'm patient, forgiving, and then crabby again. No, always the same. Always loves always forgives, always helps, always cares. His love lasts 
forever. We bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us, always forgiving us, never leave us, never forsake us. Love us and forgive us and bring us home to heaven forever. By grace alone, amen. We sing our next hymn of praise. Day by day, dear Lord, three things I pray, to see thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, to follow thee more nearly, day by day. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 7, reading just the beginning verses. You are also to say the following to my servant David. This is what the Lord of armies says. I took you from the pasture, from following sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. I have been with you wherever you went. I have cut off all your enemies from before you. I will make your reputation great like that of the great ones of the earth. I will set up a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them there. They will dwell there, and they will not be disturbed again. This is God's word. Dear children of our Heavenly Father, precious in his sight for Jesus' sake, on February 12th, in the year of our Lord, 1809, Thomas and Nancy had a little baby boy, their second child. They named him Abraham. His grandpa, Abraham, was literally a captain in the army, so they just called him Captain. And his grandma's name was Bathsheba. Captain was killed when Native Americans attacked his son Thomas, saw him die. Thomas, Abraham's dad, was a farmer and a cabinet maker and a carpenter. Abraham's family went to what was called separate Baptist church, so there was no alcohol, no dancing, no slavery. When Abraham was nine years old, his mom died from what was called milk sickness. Abraham didn't like all the hard work, the back-breaking work of farming. It was too much work. Abraham said he preferred reading, scribbling, writing, ciphering, writing poetry. Abraham preferred to read books. He liked to read the King James Bible, Aesop's Fables, Pilgrim's Progress, Robinson Crusoe, and the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Who knew that this little boy named Abraham, who grew up in 
Indiana would end up being the 16th president of the United States of America. More amazing than that, nobody thought that Jesse the shepherd, who had a youngest son named David, that one day David would be the king of Israel, that he would go from watching sheep in the hills around Bethlehem to live in the palace in Jerusalem to be the king of God's people Israel. That's pretty nice. But the real blessing was the fact that David is part of Jesus' family tree, that David is actually literally physically descended from Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. This fourth Sunday of Advent, Pastor Claude explained it very well when he said, the precious thing about today is the gift that we have received from God, that he would stir up his power to rescue us and deliver us. On account of my sins and my mistakes, I am in terrible danger. But the fact is that Jesus gives us faith and forgiveness and fills our hearts with Christmas joy. Context, part of God's word we're concentrating on, took place ballpark 3,000 years ago. 3,000 years ago. This is about the time that they stopped having judges and were going to have kings. Time of the judges was coming to an end. It was a bad time. It was a sad time. The letter to the Hebrews talks about the judges. It's called the chapter of heroes of faith. You know this? Heroes of faith. Hebrews chapter 11. What more should I say? There would not be enough time for me to continue to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets by faith. They conquered kingdoms, carried out justice, obtained things that were promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edges of the sword, were made powerful after being weak, became mighty in battle, and caused foreign armies to flee. Run for your life. Here comes the army of the God of Israel. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, did not accept their release so that they might take part in a better resurrection. Still others experienced mocking and lashes. In addition to chains and imprisonment, they were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were tempted. They were killed by the sword. They went around in sheepskins and goatskins, needy, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them as they wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. If we are ever tempted lately to feel sorry for ourselves, to think, my life is rough and I got troubles and I got problems and where is my Savior when I need him? Then think about these heroes of faith. All of their troubles and all of their trials and all of their suffering and all of their pain until their heavenly Father brought them home to the peace and rest and joy and safety of heaven. Heroes of faith to the glory of God. Dr. Lorenz wrote about the judges, the people's Bible about judges. I talked about that in November. And doc, my, friend, my friend, Dr. Lorenz, said that Israel was, was like going down the drain. Literally, around and around and down and down, it just got worse and worse and worse. Our Heavenly Father decided God's people needed a king. A king to lead the army of the Lord, to lead his people back to serving the great I Am. And so the Lord blessed them with Saul. But Saul failed God's people again and again and again. He was not faithful to God's word. Finally, Pastor Middlestead quotes Samuel. Samuel said to Saul, Does the Lord take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obedience to the voice of the Lord? Still today you bump into people who say, All the church wants is my money. Not an old example of faulty thinking. Nathan told Saul, You think, you think God, God wants offerings? that that's what he's impressed with? Know this, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. 
For rebellion is the same as the sin of witchcraft, and arrogance is like having useless idols or consulting household gods because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you. Nobody knows for sure who wrote First and Second Samuel. In fact, in the beginning, it was just Samuel. It was just Samuel. When they translated the Bible into Latin, the Vulgate into Latin, okay, that was the first time they said, well, this part is First Samuel, this part is Second Samuel. How do I say Samuel probably didn't write it down? Well, a whole bunch of stuff that happens in First and Second Samuel. Samuel was already dead, which would make it hard. And so, to write that stuff down, the house of Saul declined. It became less and less. The house of David became more and more. Jesus was crowned, or David was crowned king in the south in Judah first, and then a little bit later he was crowned king in the north. The king of Israel. The Jebusites in Jerusalem were defeated and driven out. The Philistines were defeated and driven out. David moved into the palace in Jerusalem. And God gave his people peace. King David thought, you know what would be swell now that the Ark of the Covenant is safe in Jerusalem and our country is safe from our enemies? If I would build a temple, a place to put the Ark of the Covenant, a place to offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and praise to God. Our text begins then with the Lord speaking to Nathan what he is to pass on to King David. You are also to say the following to my servant David. This is what the Lord of armies says. I took you from the pasture, from following sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. Who saw this coming? Jesse's youngest son, who so far had spent his life following sheep, leading them, trying to find for them just some small pasture of fresh green grass for them to eat, to try to lead them beside the still waters where they could be refreshed. When sheep have good grass to eat, they have sweet still water to drink, when they know they are safe, then they lie down. Then they lie down in the pasture because they know the shepherd is looking out for them. Now I am safe. Now I am good. And David understood what the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I have nothing to be afraid of. And so, the Lord said, I have been with you wherever you went. I will make your reputation great, like that of the great ones on the earth. David was a warrior. Remember? David and Goliath, armed with his slingshot, he brought the mighty warrior Goliath down. David protected his father's sheep. He had a shepherd's rod, a stick, five, maybe six feet tall. If the sheep were in danger from a lion, from a bear, from a pack of hungry wolves, they didn't get to the lamb chops till you went through David and his big stick. Or maybe David would get out his slingshot, one smooth little stone, right between the eyes. David's shot with his sling was deadly because his heavenly father made it deadly. Famous, David and Goliath. Famous, the star of David. Famous, David in Jerusalem. David is our king. And the Lord is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. When your days are complete and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after you your seed. He will come from your own body. I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He will be my son. When he sins, I will discipline him with the rod used by men and with blows of the sons of men. Nathan told David that you're not going to be the one to build my temple. You're not. Now, 
If you were David and you wanted to build a house to the Lord, a safe place to offer sacrifices to the great I Am, if you were going to be the one to build a place to keep the Ark of the Covenant safe, and God said, uh, thanks, but no thanks, what would you say? Would you say, fine, fine, fine. You know, I just wanted to do something nice. I wanted to show my gratitude and my thankfulness, but fine, excuse me. What was I, what was I thinking? Would you be tempted to say that? David was not. David realized what God's word says is true, that he was a man of war. He had blood on his hands from hand-to-hand -hand combat in battle. If the Lord wanted his son Solomon to build the temple, you know, we have our plans. We think we know what we're doing and where we're going and what's going to happen next. Really? If Solomon was going to build the temple, his son, then what could David do? I won't say I don't know because I do. Gather the materials. Let's get all of the construction material together. What are we going to need? The best, only the best. If this is going to be for my father's house of prayer, it's going to be the best. First Chronicles chapter 22, plans for the temple. When's the last time you read a little First Chronicles? Then David said, this is the place for the house of the Lord God, for the altar, for burnt offerings for Israel. Okay, first thing, what? Location, location, location. What's it called today? The temple, the temple mount, okay? The wailing wall, the exposed foundation where people come to pray. This is where the temple was going to be built. David said to gather together the aliens who were residents in the land of Israel. He lined up stone cutters to prepare trimmed stones for building the house of God. Chiseled with hands, stone so massive, we still don't know today, how did they possibly move them and set them so perfectly straight one upon another that cement would have been superfluous. You just pile up the rock on top of rock on top of stone. He provided a large amount of iron for making nails for the doors of the gates, and he provided so much bronze for the fittings that it was not weighed. I mean, there was, you know, how much we got? A lot. How much exactly? Don't worry. We got more than enough. More than, you don't, you don't have to figure that out. He provided cedar logs beyond number because the Sidonians and the Tyrians brought a large supply of cedar logs to David. Where is that from? Tyre and Sidon. Still today, what is their flag? What is their flag, you know? Two cedar trees, that's their flag. They still have some of the greatest lumber in the whole wide world. David said, my son Solomon is young, inexperienced. The house to be built for the Lord will make his name very great and give him glory in all the lands. Therefore, I will make preparations for it. So David completed many of the preparations before his death. He summoned his son Solomon, commanded him to build the house for the Lord, the God of Israel. Nathan said, your house will stand firm. Your kingdom will endure forever before your throne will be established forever. Who's that? That's the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Redeemer and Rescuer of all of God's people from all of their sins. Forever, time, time. I think time is kind of a funny concept. God invented that when he made the world. Genesis chapter 1, the evangelical heritage version. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was undeveloped and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light. It was good. He separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. The darkness he called night. There was evening. There was morning. The first day. One day, 24 hours, 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute. Now you could keep track of time. Six clumps 
of 24 hours, God made a lot of things and stuff. Huge. How big? To measure, to, to try, to, to try, to begin to measure across the universe, I don't know. It's what? A couple billion light years. Professor Chesky would say you can't wrap your brain around that. I, billions of light years, and yet there are some things so tiny, so small, that an electron microscope has trouble seeing them clearly. So he made big stuff and a lot of really tiny stuff also. God looked at what he had made, and it was good. Time, time. How, how, long, how long does a person live? Well, back in the day, people like Methuselah, 969 years. How would you like to live 969 years? People would say, you're only 500 years old. What do you, what do you know, wet behind the ears? 500. Then you had people like Moses who lived to be how old? 120. 120 years old Moses lived. He didn't wear glasses, Moses. Didn't wear glasses. You stand up in front of church, you look almost, not everybody, but pretty near, pretty near. Everybody's wearing glasses. Moses did not wear glasses. Moses did not have a walker. Moses did not use hearing aids. He was 120 years old, and he was strong. Most people don't live to be 120 anymore. Average today, 70, maybe 80, maybe longer. If God gives us the strength. Still, God's word says the days of our lives add up to 70 years or 80 years if we are strong. Yet the best of them are trouble and sorrow, for they disappear quickly and we fly away. Who can understand the power of your anger? But your fury is consistent with the fear that is owed you. Then the little heading in the EHV says, Mortal man needs God's grace. Teach us to number our days in such a way that we bring a heart of wisdom. Turn, O Lord, how long? Change your mind. Toward your servants, satisfy us in the morning with your mercy so that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. This is Advent, Christmas, New Year's time. Time to do what? Time to go home and read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read and study and meditate on and think about and pray about God's word. If you have some friend or relative, you don't know what to get them for Christmas, get them a Bible. Get them a Bible. Which one? Anyone. Anyone. Get them an EHV. Get them an NIV study Bible. Get them a, whole, a Holman Christian Standard Bible. Get them a New American Standard Bible. And encourage them to read it. What else can you buy them for Christmas? A prayer book. A prayer book. Publishing House has a prayer book. It's called There's a Prayer for That. There's about 394 prayers in this little book. There's a prayer for that. There's even a prayer, do you know this? There's even a prayer in there called I Hate My Pastor's Sermons. That's the name of the prayer. I Hate My Pastor's Sermons. And I thought, I looked it, I looked it up. I thought it would say, you know, pray for your pastor that God makes him smarter and does a better job and is more prepared and more skilled. And, and, and it doesn't. You know what it says? It says, what's wrong with <laughs> It says, what's wrong with me? That I don't appreciate and understand and help me to pay attention, help me to understand, help me to know, and help me to appreciate my pastor's sermons and to thank Jesus for them. See? Buy that little prayer book, and it'll help you pray for things. That I never would have thought to pray about that. What a precious gift. And then tell people about baby Jesus. Tell your friends and relatives and neighbors and people you bump into at the Piggly Wiggly that Christmas is about the Christ child. This little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. Everybody was wrapped in swaddling clothes. If you're born in Russia today, they will wrap you in swaddling clothes. 
they pop you out and they wipe off the pudding and then they wrap you in little strips and your arms and legs, blah, and all of a sudden they snug them in and wrap them tight and hold you close. A baby in swaddling clothes was nothing. Baby in swaddling clothes lying in a feed box, now that's something you don't see every day. You don't see a baby in the manger. Except the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the eternal, the eternal, forever Son of God made flesh to live among us, to live without sin and to die a tortured death on a tree, to rescue me and to rescue you from all of our sins. Christmas, Good Friday, Easter, I can hardly wait. Good Friday, Easter. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Don't forget. Amen. Now may the Holy Spirit who gives us the gift of saving faith defend our faith, increase our ability to live and share the gospel till we see Jesus face to face forever. Amen. We publicly declare our saving faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Your Savior thanks you for your offerings and support of gospel work here on earth. You may drop them in the basket in the back or submit them by mail or give online. Many options to show your thankfulness to your Lord. Um, in our prayer today, we'll have a time of silent prayer. And during that time, uh, we have many in our congregation for whom we can pray. We pray for the Babinick family. Uh, that Mrs. Darlene During was taken home to heaven this past week, uh, that the Lord turned their tears of sadness into tears of joy. We pray that the Lord continue to be with Pastor and Nancy Schultz. Nancy is uh, battling pneumonia at home and still trying to get rid of that cough. Uh, we pray for Jessica Christian, Laura Schultz, and Tom Probst. Uh, just some of our members who are undergoing tests and treatments as they continue to battle cancer. We pray for Joanne Rupnow, who is at Rainbow Hospice. We also offer a prayer of thanks for the Henriquez family and the birth of their healthy baby girl, Audrey, who, if it is the Lord's will, will be baptized in a private ceremony this afternoon. We pray for all of these that God grant them relief from their sorrow, recovery from sickness or disease, if that is his will, but that no matter what, he works all things for their eternal good and that he continue to hold them in his everlasting arms. Please stand for prayer. Come, dear Savior, we long for your appearing. Come to cheer us with your promises as you once cheered your ancient people throughout their long night of waiting and watching. Come to restore our hope. Rouse us from the slumber of despair. Lift our hearts from petty, earthbound worries. And direct our eyes above from where you will soon come to make all things new again. Come and work in us a godly grief and a genuine sorrow over our sins as we wait for your coming. Forgive us for the shameful way we have dishonored you 
and the unloving way we have dealt with one another. Through your mighty word, stir up in us a ceaseless yearning to give ourselves to others as you have given yourself for us. Come also to rekindle our joy as we prepare to celebrate your first coming. Don't permit all of the worries and cares and concerns and divisiveness in the world around us to rob us of your peace or deprive us of time to ponder and wonder at your word. Fill us with the quiet delight of finding you in the manger and keep our hearts and minds undisturbed by the great throng that streams by uncaring. We pray also for those enduring great sorrow, for those undergoing spiritual trial, and for those whose restless hearts have no knowledge of your coming. Comfort, strengthen, and illumine them with your Savior Jesus. Hear us, Lord, as we now bring you our private petitions. Come quickly, dear Lord, and fill our longing eyes with the light of your coming. We wait, we watch, and we put our hope in you. Amen. We join together in the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we'll continue with a modern arrangement of the old hymn, Comfort, Comfort, All My People. Uh, this hymn expresses the anticipation and the joy of the prophet Isaiah as he wrote these words. There will be an introduction, a couple of introduction, introductory lines from Professor Schrader, and then you will be invited to join along with him um, in the verses. Speak to all Jerusalem of the peace that waits for them. Tell them that their sins I cover, that their warfare now is over. Comfort, comfort all my people, speak of peace, so says our God. Comfort those who sit in darkness, groaning from their sorrows load. Speak to all Jerusalem of the peace that waits for them. Tell them that their sins I cover, that their warfare now is over.
All their sins our God will pardon, blotting out each dark misdeed. All that well deserve his anger, he no more will see or heed. They have suffered many a day, now their griefs have passed away. God will change their aching sadness into everlasting gladness. John the Baptist's voice is crying in the desert far and near, calling people to repentance, for the kingdom now is here. Oh, that warning cry obey, now prepare for God away. Let the valleys rise to meet him, and the hills bow down to meet him. Straighten out the crooked highway, make the rougher places plain. Let your hearts be true and humble, ready for his holy reign. For the glory of the Lord, now earth is spread abroad. And all flesh will see the token that his word is never broken. Once again, good morning and welcome to all. Thank you for joining us for worship. Special thank you uh, to those who served us today, Pastor Schultz for preaching God's word, um, our musicians today, uh, those who helped with technology, ushers, everyone uh, certainly wouldn't be the same without your gifts. Many opportunities to worship this Christmas season. Um, today, the TSL kids will be having their Christmas service at Luther Prep. Um, I've been told that there is still space available in the 6 p.m. service, so if you'd like to hear um, our, many of our children proclaiming the good news of Christmas, 6 p.m. would be a, a service to attend. And then on Thursday, Christmas Eve, we will have three services, 4, 6, and 8 p.m. Um, that will be a candlelight song service with uh, special music and readings and a a sermon as well. And then Friday morning, Christmas Day, will be our Sunday schedule, 8, 9.15, and 10.30. Then you see, uh, looking ahead, New Year's Eve, 4 and 7 p.m., with Holy Communion as well. May God bless your day, and may he bless your week as you travel again to the manger to bow down and worship your King. <laughs> 